So welcome back. Um, we're starting um, this afternoon with our keynote uh, presentation from Peter Mataji from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, so a bit of introductory about uh, introduction for Peter. So Peter joined um, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation in July 2019 and is currently their chief analyst. Before joining JRF, Peter worked for almost 20 years in the civil service, where he led on a number of issues, including poverty analysis and policies at the Department of Work and Pensions, where he developed measures for persistent poverty and child poverty. Previously, he worked on fuel poverty and energy price analysis at the Department of Trade and Industry, and he's passionate about using data to have an impact on improving living standards and has been developing and using financial surveys for over 20 years. And today, Peter will talk to us um, about key data infrastructure, so how the JRF uses survey data to understand and work out ways to reduce poverty. So, Peter, over to you. Thanks, everyone. I'm just going to wait for my PowerPoints to load, but lovely to see you. It's a real pleasure and honour to be speaking here at this event. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Hopefully you'll see my slides. Um, so I'm hoping to cover five things um, in various degrees of detail. So a bit of an introduction about JRF. What's our use of family finance surveys? What do they tell us about the state of the nation? What future work are we planning? And also a bit of a kind of cheeky session about um, what I would like to see from uh, the surveys we're talking about today in terms of future developments. So that's the plan. Um, so a bit about JRF. So um, hopefully some of you will have heard of us, um, but we're basically an independent social change organisation um, wanting to support and speed up the transition to a more equitable and just future, free from poverty, where the people and the planet can flourish. And we've been around for about 120 years, um, established by Joseph Rowntree, as you might have guessed from the title, um, to help and understand the root causes of poverty. Um, and actually, what some of our heritage includes some of the first social services surveys ever conducted. So. Uh, Seaborn Rowntree, one of Joseph Rowntree's sons, did a survey of York in, at the end of the 19th century. And you'll see on the bottom right actually a slide in a presentation that he did from about 100 years ago. So sitting around, and one way it's nice to have the kind of heritage of 100 years of history of, of, of social surveys. In another way, it's a bit depressing still to be talking about poverty, um, you know, 120 years after the, after the organisation was established. But it's, 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 as I say, I'm really proud of some of the work that we've published and hopefully are still still pushing forward with. Um, so how do we use uh, the family finances surveys? Well, basically, they're the black backbone to lots of our work. Um, we have an annual uh, poverty report called UK Poverty. Um, and basically, all of the data sources we're talking about today, plus more, are, are fundamental to that report. We try and make a kind of um, holistic kind of picture of poverty in the UK. And we use the best data sources we can possibly find um, to try and bring as much, uh, much information to, to bear as possible. And you'll see some of my future slides will include some of our UK property data. Uh, it came out in, in January. And so at some points, um, because I'm using the data from January, there's another wave of surveys that I'll that I'll mention, but aren't always in the charts just because we've taken them from that report. So that's a bit of a caveat. Um, so what about more specific pieces of use? So um, one of our big campaigns at the moment is um, to reform the benefits system to make sure people can actually afford essentials. So we've done lots of work, mainly based on the Living Cost and Food Survey, about um, how much the essentials cost. And um, in that first session, we saw that the proportion of um, money being spent on essentials was higher for poorer households and richer households. But basically, when you look at and tot up the totals from that and add those up that are kind of you know hopefully universally accepted essentials like food electricity water you actually get an amount that's quite a lot higher than the universal credit amount so basically if you're just on the standard rate of universal credit then you wouldn't be able to afford the essentials and we we're able to use that loving the living costs and food survey to establish that and we've got a big campaign that you'll see a picture of later on in the presentation to try and bring up at least a standard allowance so it at least meets that essentials uh, and things like deductions don't take take you below that line. So that's a living cost and food survey, but we also use something called the IPPR model, which is built from the HBI, FRS and living cost and food survey to look at different policy options to see, well, how much do these policies cost and what are their impacts on poverty? Um, you know, who 
games and who pays for different policies. So, you know, it's not just straight off um, survey information. It's some things that are built off the back of the surveys that are really critical in terms of working out what's happening uh, and what's the future options. And you'll also see if you if you're reading The Guardian, other papers are available uh, over the weekend that the IFS is part of some work that we funded compared um, the increase to the £20 a week in universal credit with the subsequent increase of the taper and work allowance on poverty and found basically both help poverty but the £20 a week was about twice as effective as the um, the taper rate and, and um, work allowance changes because basically um, the work allowance and taper rates only affected people in work. Um, but again, that's that's available um, using the IFS model in this instance, but again, based off HBI and FRS, which is a fundamental building block. And um, so here are a couple of products that actually JRF pay for and, and, and have built over, over the years. So one is destitution in the UK. So one of the, um, the disadvantages of using these surveys is they're based on the household population. Um, so, um, and quite often are sampled from the postcode address files. So if you are homeless or in um, shared accommodation, um, you um, like halls of residence and so forth, you're missed out from these surveys. So um, JRF for about the last um, almost about six, seven years have come have produced destitution in the UK, which is basically quite an innovative um, study that's um, surveying services and service users um, to get at the destitute population. Uh, but what we do use is lots of the surveys I've mentioned before to actually build up that picture to gross up from the destitution services to a national picture to also compare and contrast and see what's happening on the surveys to kind of QA the data there. So hopefully that's a way that JRF sort of fills in a bit of the gaps in the kind of data landscape, but also uh, we're only able to do so with the help of these surveys. And then on the right, um, we uh, we have something called the minimum income standard, which is basically um, like a socially discussed basket of goods that is a sort of a minimum acceptable living standard. So it's not a poverty line, it's, it's, it's above a poverty line, but basically through focus groups, we establish what's a kind of, a, you know, a, a, a minimum sort of uh, for socially um, social participation budget. Um, and we update that each year. We've got our next one out in September. But basically, we also compare that to uh, FRS data in the same way as households below average income looks at sort of how many people are below 60% of median income. This looks at how many people are below the minimum income standard. And as you'd expect, um, it's higher because the standard is, is higher than the poverty line. But again, it's also been pretty flat over time, which again is kind of disappointing when you would want to make progress. And we also use um, these surveys in less regular analyses. So um, we've looked a lot at deepening poverty. So one of the slides that you'll see later on is about what's happening to depth of poverty, uh, where we're using poverty, looking at poverty using a lower poverty line. We also got a slide about anxiety and, and incomes, uh, where we can look at mental health and other impacts of economic insecurity. On the first one, we're mainly using FRS for deepening poverty. Anxiety Nation mainly uses understanding society. Um, the cost of living tracker is another piece of data infrastructure that we, we um, build ourselves using uh, polling information, but we also use the FRS and HBI data to gross up the results. So again, we can't do that work without the other surveys to help build the picture up. Um, we've done work on ill health and labour market participation using WAS and HBI data, and also looked a bit about why people might be on a very low income, but actually aren't claiming means to benefits. And we've used WAS and HBI data there, partly because part of the reason is um, assets can sometimes rule you out of being eligible for means-tested benefits. So that's how we've used the, um, the data sets. But let's actually see how we've used them in reality and see some charts and, and stuff like that and see um, what's, what do these data sets tell us about the state of the nation um, you know, in, the, in the latest period. Um, so um, basically, our picture is quite a bleak one. Um, so um, you'll see on the right hand side, this is part of our campaign with the Trust or Trust on the essentials. Um, it's actually an interactive billboard where the tillboard actually comes out. And so it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, but basically, the bottom line is, as I mentioned, that universal credit is inefficient, insufficient to afford the essentials. And it's off the back of with high inflation and nine years of 1% uprating, then benefit freezes, and then basically uh, benefits lagging behind inflation. 
inflation, the basic rate of benefits being the least generous for at least 40 years. We see in our three destitution reports, particularly between the second and the third, rising destitution, with destitution up at 50% in, um, in two years. We see incredibly fast rises in, in food bank use. And we also see, um, although it's sort of not a, not a linear pattern, but um, there's more of sleeping uh, now than it was a decade ago. Uh, why might that be? Well, um, we've got almost like a dragon-shaped curve here, which is inflation. And you can see basically um, you know, it's noticeable how fast the cost of living uh, crisis accelerated. Uh, we're hopefully over the peak of inflation. Um, but we can see basically that um, you know, we had inflation at 40-year at, at, at highs. And it's not all about Ukraine because part of the part of the acceleration of inflation was actually happening before uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, obviously, the main story is energy prices, um, but now that's starting to feed through to other other commodities, especially food. Um, and you can see the blue dots are where the Bank of England had predicted in May inflation to be. But you can see that the purple, the last bits of the purple line, are actually above the the, the first two blue dots, which means that basically inflation outturn has been higher than what the Bank of England predicted. And obviously, we'll wait with anticipation to see whether um, future inflation rates actually follow the Bank of England's predictions downwards. Um, but basically, we also see through other work by the ONS and others that inflation is actually higher for lower income households because of the fact that they are spending more of their money on essentials like food and energy, which are some of the ones that are driving driving up these high rates of inflation. We also see high wage growth relative to previous years. Um, so the private sector have seen wage growth at the moment around 7% compared to about 5.5% in the public sector. However, what you can see on that chart is basically um, both of those rates are actually below inflation. So the actual uh, purchasing power of, of people's wages are actually still falling. Um, and yeah, obviously, you can add into the mix all the political turmoil and the impacts on the financial markets to see that it's been a really sort of uncertain, economically insecure period of time for people. And obviously, what we are seeing as the consequence of that is increased in interest rates, which are having an effect on mortgage holders and, and others as well. Um, so yes, um, and so it's, it, is, it is worrying. Basically, the economic outlook is gloomy even though it looks like the recession might have been avoided. And basically, the OBR have said that they think this will be the worst two years on record for household incomes. Um, and it's such a, its projection suggests that real household disposable income will be no higher in 2027 than they were in 2019 and barely higher than they were in 2017. So that means a lost decade for, of living, of, for living standards and 20 years of, of income shocks and, and, and turmoil since the global financial crisis. So that's sort of the economic context for the, around these surveys. Um, so interestingly, with, with all that, um, what has happened to overall poverty rates? Well, you'll see the purple line in the middle has been basically flat over most of that kind of turmoil, tumultuous 20 years, which obviously is, 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 is terrible in that you want poverty to be going down. But it's quite interesting to see that um, that actually poverty hasn't, you know, hasn't changed much over the period of time. Um, what poverty definition I'm using here is a relative poverty after housing cost. So basically, we take 60% of the median income adjusted for household size and composition and look at uh, who's below that poverty line. And the main data source we're using is the households below average income series. So you can see in terms of groups, um, children, uh, so there was a rising uh, sort of trend in child poverty from about 2013-14 to just to the pan just before the pandemic, again, a rising um, pension of poverty um, just until just before the pandemic, and then um, a big fall during the pandemic year, partly because of um, falling medians, partly because of the £20 a week benefit rise. And then what you see, and this cuts off the last data point, um, but basically you see quite a lot of that um, reduction reversed in the next data point because of the fact that the temporary benefit support um, had the um, gone away and because median incomes had, had started to rise again. And so that's what we see in terms of poverty levels and a bit of a trailer for um, the IFS have a report out on Thursday that we fund with, the, with, with on poverty living standards and inequality. And so there's a similar seminar there. So if you want to see the, the live update of this chart, then, then come on on Thursday to, to that seminar.
Um, what we also see in terms of economic insecurity is that workers are more susceptible to, to poverty than in the past. So the poverty rate for workers was um, around 9-10% in the mid-90s and is now sort of 13% even though there's been a bit of a fall in the last data point. But you can see also a compositional effect with more and more of um, people in poverty being in working households. Now, part of that is a good news story because un un unemployment's fallen over the period. But as you can see from the left, it's also a bit not just composition, it's also risk with the risk of poverty for workers um, increasing as well. And we think that's part of the picture of the last 20 years is an increasing prevalence of insecure work. And we've seen some of that in, in some of the earlier presentations in terms of kind of pensions contributions and stuff like that. Um, you can see pen, the poverty levels vary between and within regions, and it's really exciting to hear about the ONS um, admin-based income statistics, which can go down to, to much smaller levels than, than what you see on the chart. Um, it's also um, good to see um, other organisations actually taking the data and, and modelling themselves. So the, the left, the right-hand um, map of England is from University of Loughborough's and then Child Poverty Coalition's um, after housing cost small area income uh, poverty estimates um, for children. Um, which is based off a DWP methodology, but done after housing costs. So again, another organisation being able to take the data and, and, and work with it is really important. Um, and you can see so some of the drivers of poverty. So some of the regions which have got the highest poverty rates, so London, mainly due to, uh, to high housing costs. So if you look at it on a before housing cost basis, basically London's sort of in the pack, but when you look at it on an after housing cost basis, um, it's, it's, it's way out in the lead or it's, in, in the, it's, it's amongst the, the highest rates of poverty with the North East, West Midlands and Wales, where the picture is more about low earnings than, than high housing costs. So you can see different drivers. Um, and it, poverty rates vary enormously by ethnicity. So you can see um, uh, the white ethnic group, uh, broadly flat poverty rates, um, but at the lowest levels around 20%. Uh, really good progress um, in terms of reducing poverty for the Pakistani and Bangladeshi ethnic groups, but from sort of scandalously high to still really high uh, poverty rates, so still a lot more to be done. Um, whereas for the black ethnic groups, really high and sort of not budging for, for 20 odd years. Again, all very worrying as well. Um, so yeah, that's also some compositional data. Um, as I said, um, housing has a big effect. So you can see uh, the social renting and private renting have got highest poverty rates uh, compared to buying a mortgage and owned outright. So quite a lot of the um, worries about mortgage rates, actually it's affecting a group with relatively low poverty rates, but ones that could, could increase over time after we look after housing costs. Um, but you can see the effect of housing costs. So basically um, about a third and about half, a third of social renting poverty is um, due to housing costs and about half is due to private renting poverty is due to housing costs where people are pushed into poverty by their housing costs. Again, a really persistent gap between um, people who are disabled and people who are not disabled in the terms of their poverty rates. Um, obviously, there's a bit of volatility over time, but broadly speaking, very little progress in kind of closing that gap and very little kind of progress in, in reducing either of those series over time. Um, yes. So again, worrying and disappointing. And here's a chart where we do actually see a trend upwards. So basically the red line is in very deep poverty. So this is where someone has got, so we've used a poverty, normal poverty line of 60% of median income. Um, the, deep poverty, the deep poverty is 50% of median income threshold and very deep poverty is 40% of median income threshold. And basically you can see that all of the changes over the last um, sort of 20 odd years are in the very deep poverty rate. Um, so it's all people who are further away from the poverty line. And all of the kind of evidence suggests that the longer and the deeper you are in poverty, the worst, uh, the worst outcomes you've got. Um, and this obviously ties in with lots and lots of other data sources in terms of the levels of destitution, levels of food bank use, um, all up. So uh, Trussell Trust uh, distributed 2 million food parcels in 2021, twice the 1 million distributed in 2015. Also got tripling in recorded diagnosis of malnutrition of people admitted to hospital between 2008 and 2021. Um, so lots and lots of, of really worrying statistics to kind of co corroborate this information.
So who's it? Who poverty been deepening for? Well, basically, quite a lot of the groups who are already more likely to be in poverty have seen their poverty deepening. So lone parents, large families, uh, disability, uh, workless households who are already really high. Um, and then again, ethnic minority uh, backgrounds, but it does vary by ethnic groups. Um, and you can see basically there is a, a, almost like a direct kind of policy one-to-one -one relationship because lots of these groups are more reliant on social security benefits and what's happened to social security benefits over the last decade or so actually they've been frozen or operated by one percent so in a way it shows the impact of policies can have on very deep poverty because that's that's one of the key drivers that you can see in the in the in the in the data and what's the consequences? Well, there's loads and loads of consequences. Um, but this is quite a crowded slide. But basically, what you can see is that the and every any block of five, which is each different kind of um, mental health conditions, it's worse. It's worse. There's more high prevalence. The the lower the income you've got. And so that's that's what you see across all of those twelve dimensions of mental health um, uh, sort of illnesses. Um, so what's happened? So basically, and, and I, I heard from the ONS about trying to bring surveys up to date, and obviously there will always be a, a, a big lag on surveys just because of the kind of field work and the kind of data processing and so forth. Um, but it's really important to us to actually try and bring things up to date so you can use administrative data and we can also do our polling data to try and bring things bang up to date. Um, so this is sort of taking, so the last survey year is 20. Uh, 21, 22. Um, so you can see sort of what happened in 21, 22, um, then, and then sort of 22, 23, and then right up to date. And so if you look at the benefits line, for instance, you can see that benefits were uprated at 3.1% uh, in April 2022 and weren't uprated again until April 2023 when there was a 10% benefit uprating. But you can see what happened while that was happening was basically inflation marched on, earnings marched on, but at a slower rate, and benefits have only caught up with earnings from April, but obviously you've had two years of rising inflation to actually cope with during that during that period where benefits have either, you know, have only increased by about three percent for the second of those two years. So no wonder um, that we see lots of kind of financial stress, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, and, you know, all the things I've said: record price in, in rises for essentials, interest rates rising, and also just very kind of lack of kind of resilience because of all the previous shocks that people have gone through over the period in terms of low savings, low credit availability and rising interest rates. Um, and so what we've done is um, with the help of Savanta, we've done a, a poll of people going about essentials and you can see um, basically, we, and so basically this is a poll of people in the bottom 40% of the income distribution, so it's not the whole of the income distribution, but what you can see is of that bottom 40% of the income distribution, massive rates of going about essentials. So. Um, Almost half of the people we surveyed were, were cut down on the size of or skipped meals. Around a third had gone hungry, and even sort of you know ten percent have gone without their prescriptions, which again is obviously you know then can be kind of a vicious cycle of then things getting worse to you as you get ill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this equates to 7.3 million low income essential uh, low income households going about essentials and this is our fourth one of these surveys and basically it's it's gone up and stayed where it's where it's been since the first survey so we haven't seen much increase but equally um it's at a sort of scandalously high level over time um, so that's sort of a survey of um, like living living standards at the moment particularly for the poorest i want to talk a bit about future work by the jrf um, so look out for, um, so we've done lots of work. So we've, we've, we've looked at very deep poverty, but we're now looking at persistent very deep poverty using understanding society. So what are the reasons why people might be in very deep poverty for longer? We're also looking at the care penalty, again, using understanding society. So um, after somebody um, um, has, a, has a child or has starts becoming an a, a informal carer for someone with a disability, what's their kind of pay penalty? We're looking a bit about, um, the housing stock, so private rents we've saw is, is a really bad impact on poverty status because it's expensive and insecure. Is there options about increasing the social, um, social, the size of the social sector, so by moving stock into the social sector? Um, also, we're going to do lots of work on the essentials guarantee, and hopefully, you'll see more campaigning on that basis. We're actually 
paying for a new bit of social science infrastructure, so a longitudinal survey of economic insecurity, working with the University of Oxford on that. And hopefully we'll be developing some new pieces of analysis infrastructure, um, which is sort of a way of getting into, into data more. Um, so that's a bit about what the JRF's up to. Uh, what would we like from survey providers, seeing that they're all on, on the call? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, all, the, all the people who work really hard on the surveys uh, for what we have. So we have an enviable set of surveys to use um, with most information available on at least one and often more than one survey. So that's really great. And I, I do believe these embody the code of practice principles um, and that we you can point to innovations in the data release tools and use of the data over time. And that, you know, including events like this, you are responsive to users. Uh, but um, that's always there's always more, more that we would want. Um, so, uh, you know, is there anything more that can be done on timeliness? And I think also on the microdata. Um, so we had the kind of timeline from ONS at the start, which is really kind of orderly in terms of the the actual publications. But sometimes the actual microdata release is a lot less orderly and a bit kind of chaotic. Sometimes we're not knowing when things will come out. So, is there any more work that we can actually get? almost like a release date for the microdata at the same time as we know what the release date of the the survey is um is there anything we could do about sample size obviously um we know that there's issues with response rates and we also know there's issues with the field force so there's this survey's futures work that I, I i went to an event on last week which is interesting there it's a bit about like sharing developments with users in a more interactive way so i'm, I'm pleased by the expert user groups that, that was mentioned earlier but i think sometimes i feel like i'm brought in to steer something that's already decided to be done rather than sort of inputting on what needs to be done um more consistency between data sets between survey and admin data through benefit linking can hopefully um, mean that some of the sort of inconsistency between if you look at admin data benefit numbers and survey data it's a, it's a lot lower and then finally, I think there's just a bit about um, kind of transparency about differences and also clarity on quality concerns, but also kind of coherency. So um, both the ONS and EWP have income distribution statistics. So we saw income changes by quintile at, at an earlier presentation. We may well see it from DWP later on in the afternoon and they are different and in different directions. So I do feel like across government we could do with more guidance as to what is the best data sources and even if there is some necessary duplication um guiding users to what what is actually happening what's the main data source and what's you know what 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 should we be taking from them um, because otherwise people can kind of cherry pick but thank you and um yeah it's been it's been brilliant hearing all the presentations and i'm looking forward to hearing hearing more this afternoon